Yeah, I'm live on Facebook. Good morning. It's 11 o'clock on a Sunday and time for Chai and Y session 328. And this is a unique session. After 13 years, we actually have August 15th, Independence Day Sunday being a Chai and Y Sunday as well. And we thought this is a great opportunity to actually, Chai and Y you know, always goes on. We never take a break. We've had sessions on Diwali. We've had sessions on Holi, uh, January 1st. So on Independence Day, let's do something that's connected. So first, on behalf of the Chai and Y team, let me wish all of you greetings. Happy Independence Day. This is a day we remember the sacrifices made by generations before us who fought for our freedom, freedom fighters, and a lot of you know, nameless people in the country who supported them all through their endeavors. TIFR as an institution was also born just around the time of Indian independence. And the history of an institution like TIFR is intrinsically linked with the history of post-independence India. And there is actually no one better to tell us this than Dr. Indira Chaudhary. She is the person who actually set up, the, who literally, you know, by herself set up the entire TIFR archives. Right now, she's at the Center for uh, Public History at the Srishti Institute of Art, Design and Technology in Bangalore. And, uh, you know, according to me, if I have to describe her, I call her an excavator of history and a teller of stories. And she has a wealth of delightful stories to tell us. And I'm sure she will be giving us a lot of interesting nuggets about the past and about everything, how you know, political directions, scientific technology, society at large, all of them come together in the journey of science in post-independence India. So uh, without further ado, it's gonna be over to you Indira, but let me remind our audience, it's hard to do these sessions virtually. We are trying our best. Remember, we can't see you, uh, so the only way we can get feedback from you is via chat. So please enter your comments and questions uh, on chat. If you're on YouTube or on the Q&A box, if you're on Zoom or you know, chat, the comments in Facebook, and we will try and take them all up. If it's important, we will stop and interrupt and you know ask Indira to explain. If not, we will surely take them towards the end. So please do keep the questions coming. Let us know from where you're watching uh, and... Uh, uh, something is asking, what is the periodicity of Chai and Y? Let me answer that right away. Chai and Y has been happening. It happens on the first Sunday, the third Sunday, and if a month, like this month, August has five Sundays on the fifth Sunday of a month. Uh, in the era of the BC era before COVID, uh, we used to have physical sessions uh, at Prithvi Theatre on the first Sunday, at Ruparel College on the third Sunday, and at Alexandra School on the fifth Sunday in Mumbai. Now, of course, until we can go back to our venues, we are online. But still, uh, we will always continue to be online because we found now we can attract an audience that's not just limited to Mumbai, but all over. So uh, do enjoy the session. Over to you, Indira. Uh, and keep your questions coming, audience. Thank you. Thank you, Arnab. It is really an honor to be speaking today, which is the 75th Independence Day of India and to be speaking at TIFR, uh, at a session in TIFR, because the place is particularly special to me because I, as you heard from Arnab, set up the archives and that was such an opportunity. And I still remember I was so excited by what I saw there that people who worked with me, uh, Vrinda Pathare, who is now heading Godrej Archives and a number of others who joined later, as well as Mr. Islur, who had done some collecting. There was, it was very infectious, that kind of um, you know, uh, archive fever, if I can call it that, that we all have, that what can we find, what can we, and how do we then catalog it? 
And we used to regularly try to publicize the archive. And for that, I'm very grateful to two people who are here today, Surendra Kulkarni, who's to help us a lot with the audio, as well as Arnab, who I was just reminding him before we began, had actually helped us design an archive quiz, which we held um, on 30th, one of the 30th October, which was, uh, you know, Baba's birthday, which is celebrated as uh, Foundation Day in TIFR. It's been a long time, so it was a pleasure to revisit some of the material that, you know, I had looked at and I have, in fact, used them in the books I have written. And so without further ado, I'll start sharing my screen. The title of my talk today is Indian Independence, Science and the World. And this is a view from the archives because I'm going to be using a lot of archival material. The photograph you see here today must be a very early- In Indra, do you want to go to full screen mode? I am in full screen mode. Uh, no, for me, it's still- No, for me, it's, it's just showing the uh, thing along with the sidebar. One minute. Let me stop sharing. Oh, I see what you mean. The presentation mode. No, I went on the presentation mode, but I wasn't on full screen for uh, the Zoom. Is that okay? Uh, nope, it's still this. Okay, let's try now. Yeah, go there. Is that okay? No. Uh, no. Maybe you should first go to full screen mode and share that window, the presentation okay. window. Okay. Thanks. Oh. Is it working now? Oh, bring your shared window to the front. I don't know what that means. Uh, can you do that? I think that will solve the problem. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just give us a second audience. We will be resolving this issue so you can see it better. How do I bring the shared window to the front? Because I've already, it is. I just press F5. No, no, this is a okay. Mac. Last, this is a Mac. Oh. Okay. I guess it should be same, right? Or, or go to slideshow. Go to I'm slideshow. already I'm already on slideshow. So this is some desktop thing, whether it's which window is going to the Zoom. Uh, and otherwise, you oh. can share the whole uh, screen of your laptop. Then whatever you see there, that that will be. Shared. I am yeah, doing. Uh, I'm doing that actually. Oh. Uh, okay. Enter full screen. No, this is not a problem I've had before. So let me do another share.
I don't know why it keeps saying sharing is paused. Yeah, 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 I think we've got it now. now. Okay. Yeah, we've got it. Okay. Great, All right. great, great. Well, my apologies to everybody, but uh, what I was, when I stopped uh, talking, I wanted to first thank both Arnab and Surendra Kulkarni, both of whom were very quite involved with the archives. What I've chosen here as the opening slide is perhaps one of the few colored photographs taken in 1962 when TIFR's new building was inaugurated. I chose this not because it shows you Independence Day, but because this was uh, something uh, that it was held on 15th January 1962, but I chose it for an interesting reason. This is the only photograph where I've seen five national flags flying, flying behind the podium, which you can see where my cursor is. So I think I wanted to show you how science and the state were very, very connected, as Arnab says. So, Without much ado, let me begin by quoting one of my favorite uh, letters of Homi Bhabha, written, uh, we all know that he wrote to his father saying that he'd like to do, uh, you know, he would like to do physics. But uh, what I came across in this letter, which was written to his dear friend, Homi Sirwai, who was the, who, worked all his life in Bombay, was a great friend of Homi Bhabha's and was the Advocate General of Maharashtra. This is a letter that was shared by Mrs. Firoza Sirwai with me when I went to meet her about something else. And in fact, I'll have occasion to talk about that something else. So here's what he says, I'm doing engineering now, but it is not very interesting. I'm determined to do physics and astrophysics eventually. Nothing will stop me. The mere circumstances that there is an opening in steel or hydro will not change, will not change my course. And here he's talk, hinting at the Tata's, you know, the Tata Steel Company, which he was expected to join. I do not agree with modern commerce. I'm strongly opposed to the ways and ideas of the world. You may say that this will develop much friction and heat and perhaps temporary unhappiness, but I'm prepared to go through all that. Has a man in this world done anything worth doing that has been looked up to by posterity ages after his death without coming into violent conflict with the world, without bitter opposition on many sides? They have all been undeterred by the vulgar opinion and despised it. If you see my father, I earnestly ask you to impress this view upon him and convince him that scientific research is my only line. Leave no stone unturned. And this is dated 2nd August, 1928. And Baba is all of 19 at that time. And, you know, I'm just uh, very, very uh, touched by this letter because, you know, here is someone who has discovered what he wants to do and that is science. He wants to do physics, he says, and astrophysics. And he did finally do that. He got what is termed a gentleman's degree in engineering, which means he got a third class. But of course, he had to take those exams again. And his father had said, you will have another two years to give the physics exam, the physics, the tripos, but the mathematics tripos, but you will have to pass this and do better. And he did do better. He took it up as a challenge and then went on to do what he really wanted. And 10 years from that, he actually presented at the Kapitsa club, um, sorry, this is earlier. He was already presenting uh, at the Kapitsa Club uh, in nine, no, 10 years from then, 1932, uh, 38, where he spoke on the heavy electron 
And the Kapitsa Club was very, very prestigious. And you had to be very good at your work to be able to be, to be invited to the Kapitsa Club. And if you look at the signatures, this is actually from the register of the Kapitsa Club. And you'll see there is Morris Price, the, there was Brown, but there was also James, but there was Hoyle. Frederick Hoyle. So you see a range of names. And in another part of this, there was also Heisenberg. So I think, you know, they, they are whole range of, you know, well-known scientists who are presenting there. And so was the young Bhava presenting there. I also show you a photograph, which has another story. This is a photograph taken by Leticia Ramsey who was the widow of Frank Plumpton Ramsey. Those of you who know the history of computer science know the contribution of this mathematician and philosopher. And uh, Frank Plumpton Ramsey had died quite young and Leticia started running a studio where she took photographs of various people. Today, her photographs are in the National Portrait Gallery. And we managed to, this is a, this is a photograph that is there in TIFR, but the permissions of it rest with the family of Leticia Ramsey. And we were very fortunate to get in touch with her grandson, Stephen Birch, who gave us this uh, permission to use it. Now, for Baba, just as you know, he was reaching a certain point in his career, he actually was not able to continue in Cambridge because of the war. And when World War II broke out, he had just prior to that come to India and he could not return. He of course was then appointed as a professor, first as a reader and then as a professor at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. And that's when he did some experimental work. Um, and I can see that what actually sparks it off. Uh, when you see this is, is the visit of uh, Professor Millikan, who visited on second, uh, around February, 1940. So you see Millikan and Mrs. Millikan here. And he did a few experiments. Uh, you know, he visited and there were some balloon flights that were done there. But Baba, along with Sarabhai, who you see here, and the people who worked with him, begin to repeat Millikan's experiments. And, uh, you know, he actually writes to Millikan during the war, saying, you know, this is what I have uh, uh, done. I'm repeating this and this is what I'm finding. But he also tells Millikan, you know, I would do anything to come to Caltech and work there with you. Because, you know, I find that I'm really starved here. I don't talk science to anybody. I'm really missing this. And Millikan, of course, says that, you know, we all our scientific efforts are now geared to the war effort. So maybe you know, after this war is over, you could come, but not right now, there is nothing. We are not working in fundamental physics. We are doing a lot of applied work here. And that is the case, uh, you know, uh, in the UK as well, because he writes to everybody. And, you know, this, this period in his life is uh, really, I, I found it uh, quite interesting because as most of us are told the story of, you know, how Baba felt he wanted to do something for India and therefore he stayed back. I found that that was not true. He really missed doing science and the period of the war, he missed it especially. And there was no one who could tell him that, yes, come back, come back to the UK, come back to Cambridge, because, you know, it, it was just not possible. And this is another, you know, this is again, you see an experiment done in 1943. 
And here is the thing that when we archivists look at documents or photographs and we manage to trace their uh, date and the people in it, uh, we are often faced with interesting surprises. And it was because I was always interested in talking to people and recording their memories and doing um, oral history interviews, which I managed to teach myself while I was on sabbatical at the National Center for Biological Sciences, where I began by interviewing Professor Obed Siddiqui. Uh, I realized that G. V. Vasudevachar was still around. And I think Professor Srikantan, who was later one of the uh, directors of uh, 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 TIFR, he told me, no, Vasudevachar lives in Bangalore. So maybe, you know, you can find him. And so here was suddenly this very old man who was telling me about his time, you know, in the laboratory of Dr. Baba. And what was interesting about that is that this man come, came from a very poor peasant family. And uh, he actually learned how to, you know, assist in the filling up of hydrogen into the balloons and, you know, working with the equipment. And he even moved to Bombay. So this is his memory of how, you know, Baba asks him, saying, I would like to take you to Bombay. Would you like to come? I could not give an answer. I said, sir, I will ask my father and tell you. And my father told me, when Baba is asking, why can't you say yes? Why ask me? And he started laughing. Now, this family, I think, you know, science also becomes an economic refuge for this family. Because not only is Vasudevachar the uh, assistant, the lab assistant, the technical assistant of Baba, uh, his brother uh, worked with uh, Professor Dhawan and continued in uh, IISC. Vasudevachar, of course, brings all the cosmic ray equipment to TIFR when uh, the institution is founded and they finally move to Bombay. So when they move to Bombay, initially TIFR has no place. It starts in this little bungalow, which is no longer there. But when you pass Pedder Road, those of you who live in Bombay, you will see Kenilworth. It's, it's uh, got uh, these, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's an apartment complex. And I think it belongs to the atomic energy uh, uh, department. Um, and you'll find what is interesting. Let me tell you what is interesting in this photograph. You will see that there is a rain tree to this right which is actually, you know, it was on the pavement. And this particular tree was being fell down when Baba saw it and said, uh, what are you doing? He said, well, you know, the corporation has asked me to, um, you know, cut this down. It can't be on the road. So he said, okay, I'll give you some money. Just stop cutting it now. And I will find out, I'll see what can be done. Now he had a horticulturalist uh, Mr. S. D. Vaidya, who is to work in BARC and who I had the good fortune of interviewing. He was actually one of the first landscape designers uh, in, uh, uh, in India and he worked in BARC. He was trained at Pune Agricultural College and then went to France and uh, trained in Versailles. And he was asked by Baba, can you do this transplantation? And Vaidya says, of course, I can, but it will cost a lot. And Baba was, is known to have said, I did not ask you how much it will cost. I asked you, is it possible? If you pass slowly by Kenilworth today, that rain tree is still standing inside. And Vaidya later went on to transplant in the 70s, a huge baobab tree, which is still there in the residential complex of TIFR. And what I like, uh, you know, which is quite interesting, we don't have the original photograph of Baba giving his speech, a very young Baba on 19 December 45. And Sir John Colville, the governor of Bombay, looking at some tracks made by the counter telescope, which Baba is showing him. 
if you listen to that speech, the, you'll see that, you know, he just talks about cosmic rays. He does not, you know, he dispenses with the kind of niceties we've started, you know, boring niceties we've started associating with inauguration of institutions. The other person you see here is Sir Sorabji Saklatwala, who actually was the head of the Tata Trust then, the Dorabji Tata Trust, which funded TIFR. Now, this was the time, TIFR begins in 1945. And this is the time when Bombay is full of prisoners of war, particularly Italian prisoners of war, who come, uh, they, they are brought from Ethiopia into Bombay. Now, most of these uh, prisoners of war were not really trained soldiers. And uh, there's a reason why I'm telling you about them. Now, not, these prisoners of wars, as Keku Gandhi, who began Kemuld, the art gallery, uh, and he told me that these Italians who came as prisoners of war, some of them were good artists. Indians were just beginning to buy art. There was the progressive artist group. So we would have a party and some of our friends who wanted to help would come and buy. For example, Ratan Tata's father, Naval. I remember we had a party in his home and Naval was a very affable, genuinely kind person. And he invited all our potential clients who were growing to like painting to that party and buy the paintings of these Italians also. So not only were they buying the paintings of Let's see who you can recognize, Hussein, who's here. Um, and you see a whole range of others, Krishan Kanna. But you find that these artists, Ara, these artists uh, and Taib Mehta, they're all there in this photograph. Now, these artists were selling you know, their paintings at these big parties, and so were the Italians. And what is very, very interesting here is there are two or three people here who actually had come from Vienna during World War II. And there was Arthur Schlesinger, there was uh, Rudy von Leyden, and they all came to Bombay. And the progressive artist movement, which was about to take off, actually took a lot of uh, inspiration from their presence. And there was an interaction between the Italians who were there, the Viennese masters who were there. And incidentally, in TIFR, you will see a painting of Rudi von Leyden, the connoisseur. I think it is in the uh, auditorium foyer. Now, if I move from here, I'll tell you why there were so many artists, apart from the Italians who came as prisoners of war. Uh, you had a lot of Viennese, Russian, uh, German artists uh, and dancers who were in Bombay. And why were they in Bombay? Because Hitler's policy had decided that the kind of art that they were creating was really degenerate art. So this particular Nazi exhibition, Entatete Kunst, which opened in Munich on 19 July 37, if your painting happened to be there, if you were identified as someone who painted degenerate art, then uh, you, know, you, you were in trouble because most of these artists were not going to change their style. And a lot of this artwork was taken away. We were told it was destroyed, but I think some of it was saved. Incidentally, and this will be a very interesting tidbit, Tagore, who had toured Europe with his paintings in 1930, some of his paintings were in uh, the art galleries and the museums in Germany. And five of these, his paintings, which were there, were 
really exchanged for Aryan art because it was seen as non-Aryan art. But of course, I think some have again been traced. I haven't kept up with the news after they found the stash quite recently, I think two years ago. So the other person who came at this time to uh, Bombay was the dancer, Viennese dancer called Hildi Holger, whose entire family was uh, you know, taken away by the Nazis, killed by them. And she managed to come to Bombay. And uh, in fact, she started teaching uh, dance, which today we know as expressionist dance. She had her own school in Vienna and she started uh, you know, doing these classes in Bombay. And she had very unusual venues. This is again on the beach in Juhu. And these are her students, many of them Parsi women, uh, young women. And uh, they are also you know, dancing on Juhu Beach. And you find uh, what you can't see here because it was very, very light. And I think it's just disappeared now is a sketch of Hildi Holger by Magda Nachtman Acharya. And that I'll come to Magda's story in a bit because I found Magda quite literally in the TIFR archives. This is Mrs. Feroza Sirwai who had actually learned from Hildi. And that was the context in which I went to meet her because I had heard about Hildi Holger and her time in Bombay. Hildi incidentally married uh, a Boman Bahram who, you know, went away with her, they left after Gandhi was killed in 48, they went to Bombay. And uh, I think, uh, you know, she was friends with the artists and the dancers. And uh, while I was talking to Mrs. Rosa Sirwai, she said, by the way, in case you're interested, there are letters that Homi Baba wrote my husband when they were both young men. And that is the letter. One of those letters is what I began with. Now coming to, that is the sketch by Hildi Holger, if you, uh, sorry, of Hildi Holger by Magda Nachtman, if you can see it. Now I'll come to the story of Magda Nachtman and why I found it in TIFR. But before that, I want to show you this one painting of Baba's which was inspired by the Countess Azaria in Mozart's opera, The Marriage of Figaro. And this was exhibited at the Royal Academy of Indian Art Exhibition in London in 1948. Now in 47, when the committee was deciding what kind of art will be displayed in London, Magda Nachman, who had come away, run away with her husband, uh, you know, come to uh, Mr. Acharya, they, they were both communists and they had come back to Bombay because of the Nazis. Magda had in Bombay changed her style of painting. And uh, she was already living in Bombay for about 10 years, almost, or 11 years. And she too gave her painting to the committee that was looking at you know, the paintings and the artwork that will go for this Indian art exhibition uh, in London. And of course, her painting was rejected. In that context, Mr. Acharya wrote a letter to Mr. Keku Gandhi, who then wrote to Baba. And Baba then takes it up with not only Maulana Azad, but he writes to Sarojini Naidu, he writes to a whole range of people and the date is 24 July, 1947. And this is very interesting because he's making a very large argument, which is about building the nation, but not with only resources that are in India. It seems to me, he says, that the purpose of the modern section 
of Indian art exhibition in London is to give the world a picture of the achievements and cultural life of modern Indian society in the sphere of the plastic arts, and in particular painting. This cultural life is not made up only by the work of Indian artists. Artists of foreign origin domiciled in India also make their contribution to it. To exclude Mrs. Nakman Acharya's work from this exhibition, on the ground that she was born abroad would be like sending Uday Shankar's troupe abroad to a dance festival and insisting on the omission of Simki, who was his chief dancing partner on the ground that she is French. It should also be remembered that one of our best modern artists, Amrita Shergil, was of half Hungarian descent and received her entire artistic training in Paris. The point of view I take is the one taken in all progressive countries. And then he makes the statement, which I just love, and it's something that we should remind ourselves again and again. Art like science knows no frontiers, and we should not only put any, and we should not only not put any impediments in the way of foreign artists coming to this country, but should rather encourage them to do so. And the letter goes on to talk about how the USA gained from the presence of scientists who came out of Germany into the US during the war. So I think, you know, the war cast its shadow on India, but there was an attempt to learn something from what could be done. And of course, this is not heeded at that time. But what TIFR does gain, and this also has a very international dimension to it. Baba decides that once the building is ready, the new building, which we now know, uh, that there should be a mural that showcases Indian art. And of course, there is a competition. Those of you who belong to TIFR will know that, you know, these swatches, uh, this is the Hussein swatch, but, you know, they are swatches by Hebbard, and others uh, who all submitted, uh, you know, their paintings to a committee that then chose Hussein. Now, what I've put up here on the screen is uh, Bhava's sketch of Hussein in 1961. The swatch, and you see a part of the painting near the library stairs on the mezzanine floor. Now, what is interesting here is that Bhava had this idea because he had seen Picasso's mural in uh, Birkbeck College, which was, um, you know, there in the house of uh, Julian Huxley. And that was one of the few murals that Picasso had done, uh, you know, in, in somebody's home. And uh, he felt inspired and he was initially thinking of inviting Picasso. And that is true. There is a letter saying, you know, telling uh, Huxley that, you know, have you talked to Picasso? And of course, um, that uh, doesn't uh, work out. And in the end, what um, transpires is that he has this competition. But um, Hussein, interestingly, calls his uh, mural uh, Bharat Bhagya Vidata. And I had this very rare and very treasured opportunity to talk to uh, Hussein, who uh, then told me, you know, I'm like a folk painter. And I tried to portray what is India, what is the essence of Indian culture. So then I asked him, why did you name the mural Bharat Bhagya Vidata? He said, because I showed the grand year of India. And of course, he then says that Baba's most important uh, contribution was this art collection, which is in TIFR. And uh, he says, you know, if you look, there is no single collection that uh, is, is there, you know, uh, which, which compares to this. So moving on from here, I think, uh, you know, I want to also uh, say that while all this is happening, we are, uh, you know, gearing up uh, th this particular um, 
document is from the 60s, 1960s. But if you look at, you know, what I'm trying to do here is to show you material that leads up to Indian independence. So I think, you know, what I want to show is what is it that you can see in the archives that tell you the relationship between what is happening outside of science and, you know, what is happening within science and how do we get to know this? So Baba is a way in the US we're in 46 before independence and we get to know about the riots that have been going on in Bombay around that time. And I've got, uh, you know, city disturbance brought under control. But as we know, these riots went on until the end of the year. They began around February, which was the famous naval, uh, you know, the RIN, the Naval Revolt, the Indian Naval Revolt. But uh, this particular riot, which um, Kosambi here is talking about, is something that happened after direct action day in Calcutta on 16th August 1946. Violence spread to other parts as well. And I think uh, the latest casualty figures are quite high. They are 50 in a day and uh, you know the photographs are quite gruesome, so I didn't want to put that up. But uh, you notice that here he talks about one peon was stoned another held up in the Konkan by rains and fear of riots. But both were back on the job in good time. The really annoying feature is the inability to get machine tools as for the lake. All of these have come from the affected areas like Abdurrahman Street, Lohar Chawl, etc., where the shopkeepers themselves are unable to open up their establishments and curse the lots of opportunities for black marketing. Many fortunes and some lives are thus lost regularly. This is also the time when R.P. Thatte, who was you know, someone who's quite there in TIFR quite early, is working on you know, trying to make, uh, it's not the Wilson chamber, he's working on another chamber, which, uh, and, and uh, Sahiyar is working on the Wilson chamber, in spite of a sudden stroke which brought his father almost on the verge of death. I actually saw the tracks through, though the drops were too large, the chamber is now being rebuilt. So Thatte was working as well, and so was Sahiyar. Sahiyar, uh, you know, leaves and he goes off to the Natural History Museum in London. And I tried very hard to trace him, but couldn't. Uh, so this is, you know, what actually tells you in this exchange of news about the science that is going on, about what is going on outside. And that is a photograph of Kosambi. Now let's come to the actual day, 15th August, 1947. I've deliberately juxtaposed these two photographs. One is Nehru making his very famous Tryst with Destiny speech that all of us have heard. And the other is Gandhi shutting his ears against the din that is raised outside by the crowd that has gathered. And Gandhi is in Calcutta. And I think for a long time, people didn't ask, where was he? on the day of independence. He didn't believe in this pomp. He said, I'm going to be uh, with the families that have suffered so much loss. So he was in Calcutta, he was in Noakhali, he was in parts of Bengal. And before that, he was in Bihar, where they were also writing. There was also writing. And I was curious about what happened in TIFR on that day. And here is the person I found who could tell me about it. This is Professor Prahlad Chunilal Vaidya, who's uh, very famous now for something called the Vaidya metric. And uh, I was very fortunate to meet him in 2009. I like particularly this photograph of him reading something. And I think I'll tell you what that was. That was a report he had written in 1946 when he was in 
TIFR on the kind of work that he had done or his the group had done. And it was a handwritten report. I had found it, Xeroxed it and taken it to him. And he was very thrilled to see his handwriting as a young man. And he was telling me about, you know, what life in TIFR was like. He went on to leave TIFR and went to Gujarat University. He also became the Acharya there, later the vice chancellor there. But he's the only one and Vasudevachar who gave me details about what happened on 15th August. He says, when Bhava came, he asked, where is the flag? I said, there it is. He said, no, on the first day of independence, you don't unfurl the flag, you raise the flag, bring it down. After that, we raised the flag and then sang Janaganamana, raising the flag. Now that is something I learned from Bhava. This incident made me feel that even a famous scientist is an ordinary citizen. So this was really the moment that was very emotional, that you become a citizen from being subjects in British India. And therefore, this ceremony is something that, you know, why they really liked the fact that Baba reminded them, don't just put it up, let's raise it with respect and ceremony. Now, what happens that two, uh, two days after we are independent, the Boundary Award is announced. And uh, the Boundary Award is actually announced on 14th August, but fifth, uh, sorry, 17th August. It is not, the partition did not happen on 14th August, even if we try to say it that way. The partition was formalized on 17th August, 1947, two days after Indian independence. And I put up a rough map, but that is how rough it was. Some towns like Krishnanagar was for one day in East Pakistan and came into uh, India. And the same thing happened with some border towns here too. And you can see the chaos that prevailed. Now, this is something that I talked to Professor Yashpal about because I felt that somewhere scientists were affected by it. And if we continuously only ask them about the science they did, we don't ask them about you know, the citizen and the scientists, what, what happened when they became citizens, what happened, what surprised them. And this is what Yashpal says. He was doing, uh, you know, he, his family was in Lalpur, which is in Pakistan now. And uh, the college, the university was in Lahore. We spent nights guarding the locality. And ultimately, at one point, it became very serious. We were living in Pakistan, but didn't feel that there would be a transfer of population or anything of that kind. But in 1947, January, my father got transferred to Delhi, mainly on ordinance. 15th August came, and so we also participated in that emotionally and then listen to Jahal, the Jawaharlal's speech at midnight. All these were very real. The thrill which came listening to him on the radio. Simultaneously, there were these disturbances. I heard that refugee camps were being started and there was one Kingsway camp. So I took a bicycle and went to Kingsway camp. Seeing all the trauma was quite an experience. The refugees in the camps grew to thousands. And Professor Yashpal actually worked in the Kingsway camp because he not only located a lot of his family there, uh, relatives who had come, he actually reconnected with Nirmal, his wife, in the Kingsway camp. And uh, there were students earlier in Lahore University. And he met a number of students who were doing physics. So what do they do? I was an MSc student, but I wasn't sure when I was going back to it. And then what happened was I met some friends who, had all, who were also in my class and had migrated. They used to be a deputy commissioner there by name of Randhawa. One day, some of us went to meet him with Dr. D.S. Kothari, who was head of the physics department. Some arrangements were made. By that time, some teachers had also joined. 
and they had built three big rooms somewhere at the back. So those rooms could be used by the East Punjab University. Then for doing practicals, they could use the Delhi University laboratories. The Reeds Barak were allotted as our hostels. You see, this was the spirit at that time of independence. If you were in trouble, you could jump hurdles. So I think, you know, this was a little known story of how those who came from the other side were accommodated within Delhi University, but given degrees that were from East Punjab University. And this is a story I've heard from many others who came to other parts of India, how they were taken in, how they couldn't bring their papers, and they were just believed that, yes, I'm in the second year, and they continued their studies here. So it is really a very, very emotional time. It's a time of turmoil, and it is not one that doesn't affect science. So this little known story is something that I wanted to hold up before you. Uh, Indira, just to interrupt you, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Is East Punjab University what eventually becomes the PANJAB University in Chandigarh? Ah, uh, you know, I have to look into that. I don't really know. It might well be that it becomes the Punjab University. Uh, the, I, I will look into that. Yeah, I think Arun Grover would probably know this. Uh, yeah. I just, just thought that probably East Punjab University yes. is the beginnings of, you know, uh, the Punjab yes. University in Chandigarh. Probably. It, You're probably right and... about that. You're probably right about that. And it comes out of the partition. And Chandigarh, as we know, is built to accommodate those who have come after partition, right? It's a new city right. that's built. Now, the other part that I want to talk about here is uh, really the kind of nationalism, uh, you know, that we saw in those early years and right up to a little more, uh, you know, recent times was a very liberal nationalism. It was not something that, uh, you know, shut out the world. And that's why I wanted to bring in the world. And already, you know, you've seen that uh, we've talked about how science and scientists are connected across the world. And uh, it's not just about, you know, doing everything in India. It is doing things so that you do, uh, you know, a particular kind of science that will make you proud, but you don't hesitate to learn. You don't hesitate to collaborate. And this is what Baba says in his historical note that he prepares for Nehru on the foundation stone laying ceremony that happened on 1st January, 1954. And uh, this picture I've kept for several reasons. One, because of you know, this very warm welcome that you can see J.R.D. Tata giving Prime Minister Nehru, but also because of Dr. Bhatnagar. S.S. Bhatnagar, who I think today, a lot of young people don't know what he looks like. We know that they are the Bhatnagar Awards. And at that time, when Baba created this uh, historical note on TIFR, he says, fundamental research thrives best in an atmosphere that is free, permitting an unrestricted exchange of ideas. An institution for fundamental research should be open open to all scientists of eminence, whatever the country to which they belong, and should be unfettered by the secrecy regulations required in commercial and strategic uh, establishments. And this, I think, was a very important statement and one that saw Bhaba actually taking it up on several occasions. The first time is in 1948, when I came across this letter, which uh, was very, very moving because there is a civil war in China and uh, S.S. Chern, who uh, is a mathematician, uh, is probably finding it, you know, they get the news that he's finding it very difficult to carry on his work. And this is the letter that Baba writes to Chern. Kosambi and I have read concern of the spread of the war in China and the approach of the fighting to the region where your institution is, institute is located. Although we know the patriotism which prompted you to prefer to work in your own country, despite the many attractive offers from abroad, we realize that the present conditions must make 
work in your neighborhood extremely difficult, if not impossible. I'm therefore writing to offer you the hospitality of this institute and to inquire if you would like to spend one year in the first instance with us as a visiting professor. If you desire that some of your close collaborators should come with you, will you please let me know their names and their academic status so that if possible, we might be able to do something for them too. And this I found to be, you know, it's always moved me. The kind of concern you see that cuts across, uh, you know, uh, those narrow lines of, you know, that nations build. And Chern, of course, gets this letter quite late and acknowledges it very uh, gratefully. He is by then already at the Institute of Advanced Studies, Princeton. The other person who actually practically builds the experimental physics group is Bernard Peters. And uh, he is, uh, you know, uh, someone of Polish origin who had come to TIFR uh, in, uh, in the 50s. And I think here is, uh, I don't think you can read it, but that is a little, again, from the archives, but it's a clipping from the Times of India, dated the 19th April, 1954, which is sent by J.R.T. Tata to Baba, saying, uh, can you tell me what Professor Peters is doing here? Because Oppenheimer has alleged that he is a red or a communist. Indeed, Oppenheimer had said that and then taken back his words because Bernard Peters was never a card holder, but he did have leftist views. But this destroyed, you know, it, it was the era of McCarthyism and it really destroyed, uh, you know, his life. He, his passport was taken away and it was very, very difficult. And at that point, Baba invites him to TIFR and he comes and sets up the experimental program in cosmic rays and the strange particles that are, you know, that he then discovers with people who work with him is something that brings this group a lot of fame uh, at the, in the, later in the 50s, in 58. But what is very interesting here is the letter Baba writes in defense of Peters to Tata, saying, Jay, he is a scientist, he is, uh, you know, and, and he has been doing fantastic work, and that is what we'll pay attention to. So this is not, because, you know, JRD had ended the letter saying, when does his contract expire? And Baba makes it very clear that we are not into looking at that. And the Peters actually lived in the first instance almost uh, nine years. The, his children studied in Bombay and uh, his wife would work, she was a doctor and she worked in the health, health physics department in the atomic, in atomic energy. Now, this actually shows you how, uh, you know, broad-minded, how liberal this thinking was, that, you know, when you build the nation, when you build scientific, when you build the scientific establishment, you try to get the best, you try, you aspire to become uh, like the other institutions in the world. And like other institutions in the world, I think at that time, you did not have a space given to women in any leadership position. The only professor I have come across, the woman professor I came across, she was not professor, she was just a reader, uh, was Bibha Chaudhry, who leaves TIFR and goes to PRL. And I was uh, very fortunate to talk to A. Subramaniam, who had worked with her, who was a student at TIFR. And what was interesting is this exchange in the archives in 49, where Wilson and even there's another letter from Blackett is writing saying, you know, she's not a first class physicist. And, you know, most cosmic ray physicists 
who know about you know the kind of work she had done she had i think almost discovered the pymason earlier uh, is is not something that's talked about and they feel that you know it's very patronizing that uh, they feel that she needs a lot of guidance she can work uh, she cannot work in new areas uh, she's working in certain problems and has just done work so she should not be encouraged to go with a new field of work so he's agreeing with baba so i think this is something that we see in the history of a lot of science institutions and uh, i find that only when you have later in the 60s when you start when biology comes you have a completely different picture you have more and more women joining science but today i'm going to restrict myself to the 40s and 50s it was not as if there were no women scientists then in india there were but many of them face this kind of a view where they were not seen as being equal to their male counterparts i want to move to another aspect of tifr because we have now spoken so far only about physics and uh, i mentioned biology in passing but tifr had a mathematics department it had the mathematician kosambi but the mathematics department the mathematics school of mathematics was started by the man you see here to nehru's left and his name is kc his k chandrashekharan he actually comes from princeton and joins tifr and he has a very large vision to start uh you know to start a very different kind of school that will flourish and this is ms narasimhan with whom i had the pleasure of talking several times who actually told me that uh, how what were kc's methods of introducing them to new fields and how they were very conscious that in india the students who came to do phd had large gaps in their knowledge so somewhere you had to create a course so that you know you uh, you built up that students understanding of the field you built up uh, you know their taste for mathematical problems and you start addressing that basic lacuna in their knowledge because you have to fill that up before they can specialize in anything and chandrashekharan and ramanathan gave these courses and sometimes also students were asked to give seminars sheshadri and i were asked to give a seminar in measure theory both professor narsimhan and professor sheshadri passed away recently so you know they were not taught measure theory they had to teach it to themselves now they realized that many more fields should be cultivated they were all in their 30s and to have such a clear vision was amazing they were encouraging people to learn and that is the atmosphere that gets built up in tifr that is the larger nationalistic purpose it serves that you encourage people to learn no matter from where you don't you know narrow it down saying you only learn this kind of science or this kind of uh physics or this kind of mathematics so i felt that this is important to remember that tifr has a very strong mathematics department by the within 10 years of kc coming to tifr it was referred to as the princeton of the east it was seen as a place from which original mathematical work could be done and was being done so this is something that would not have happened without the encouragement of india's first prime minister jawahar lal nehru and i quote here from his speech at the inauguration of tifr's new buildings on 15 january 1962 he says the scientist has got a very important role to play 
And it is important, I think, that we should encourage him to play that part. Therefore, the growth of science in India is very welcome to me. And insofar as I am concerned, the government of India will encourage the growth of science in the future, as it has done in the past. And of course, he refers again to the eminent scientists who had come here from abroad. I forget the exact numbers now, but I think there were about nine Nobel laureates sitting in the audience in uh, TIFR that day. And uh, today I'm not able to recall immediately, but I know Patrick Blackett was there and a whole range of uh, you know, them who are there, the Nobel laureates. And I'm happy they have come because it has been a pleasure and a privilege of the Atomic Energy Department to cooperate with other governments and eminent scientists in various countries. Their coming here today is very welcome so that we might strengthen the bonds that tie us to scientific developments elsewhere anymore, uh, you know, not encouraged anymore. And I think, you know, this is, that's why I've chosen the speech. And now I'll play you another part, the end of the speech, which, um, you know, I uh, really enjoy. This is uh, Nehru's speech. Let me find it. So I'm grateful to Dr. Baba for this opportunity given to me to come here, to associate myself with this um, ceremony, and to meet many eminent people. Now, if I'm supposed to inaugurate this... So that is the uh, end of, you know, Nehru's speech, formally, and you can see that that so. is, you know, that's pleasure. Nehru's voice from 1962. But I'm told that that day, he was really very tired. And uh, he gave the speech and went immediately to a rally because Krishna Menon was standing for election and Nehru went came to support him. And in the evening, he came back for dinner to Bhava's house. And scientists present there, people like Yashpal have told me, suddenly we noticed that he was so alive and so excited, which he wasn't in the morning. In the morning, he seemed quite tired because, you know, there was just too much happening. And uh, he said, we realized that, you know, he really drew inspiration from the crowds that came to see him and he was you know he talked to us and we told him what we were doing but i think without the support tifr would not have grown into the kind of institution it is so i'm grateful sorry, to Dr. sorry. i want to end by talking about two metaphors that i keep coming across in the archives, and I feel, you know, they have some salience today. This is Dr. Bhatnagar speaking at the foundation stone laying ceremony in 54. So the TIFR buildings did take very long, it took eight years before the building was made. And uh, so Bhatnagar at that ceremony says, I'm like an old gardener planting a mango tree. You ask me whether I expect to eat the mangoes from this tree. At my age, I know I perhaps go. I mean, I think there's a mistake in the typing. But all my life, I have enjoyed mangoes not from a tree planted by myself. I would not have had mangoes if other men had not done what I'm doing now. And he's referring here to the science institution. And I think this is a beautiful metaphor that, you know, you may not wait for that fruit. It will fruit in another season, in another time in the future, and someone else will enjoy those fruits. And ironically, within a year, exactly to a year of uh, him saying this, this was 1st January, 1954, 1st January, 1955, Dr. Patnagar passed away. And Bhava too, years later, would use the same metaphor. A scientific institution, be it a laboratory or an academy, has to be grown with great care, like a tree. 
Its growth in terms of quality and achievement can only be accelerated to a very limited extent. That is a this is a field in which a large number of mediocre or second rate workers cannot make up for a few outstanding ones. And a few outstanding ones always take at least 10 to 15 years to grow. And how right he was, because within 10 years, within 15 years and 21 years, that is the year when Baba passes away in 66, you had TIFR standing there as one international institution in India at that time. And then since then it has grown. I chose this also, this metaphor also because I felt that the way the tree of science was planted, it was strong enough and had strong roots. It has strong roots even today. So that even if branches, if people want to cut it down, it will still live on. But it is not true of the archives. And I want to make a point here that the archives have not grown roots in the way other institutions have. So my appeal as a historian, has, as an archivist is that we look at ways in which we can really nurture archives so that you know our past is not a made up past. Our past is not an imagined past, but a real one. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Indira. Thank you for <laughs> listening to you is always one learns so much new about TIFR that one never knew before. Um, so uh, if you don't mind, uh, would you like to take a few questions which have come up? Uh, I will of course, of read course. them out. Um, so uh, let's start with a question from Alak, uh, which uh, he had put on the chat. Uh, Alak, if you want to ask, I can unmute you, but I can also ask the question right here. Uh, he says that the old hutments in the TIFR campus uh, were used to house Italian prisoners. Uh, is that, you know, is there any evidence about it or do you know anything more about were there Italian prisoners of war actually at, uh, at TIFR at any time? Hi, Alak. Yes, I remember telling you that and we had photographs of the Hutmans. Now, this is something that was just cursorily written somewhere in one of those, uh, you know, notes, but it was not something that, you know, I, I haven't looked into the evidence, but one could find this evidence. But because I know some of the Italian prisoners lived near Chakala. Chakala is where Keku Gandhi had a factory, and that's how he got to know them. And interestingly, Italian prisoners were also in Chennai. They were also in Bangalore. And in Bangalore, I know, you know, the Hutmans are still there where they used to live. And again, we've not seen documentary evidence about it. But, uh, you know, I've met people who would actually go to watch them play football. I have met an old man who works in the, what used to work in the India coffee house, who used to take the coffee truck there. He was a very young boy. And he said, these Italians would go mad. Suddenly there was coffee for them, you know, and they were willing to pay anything. So I know that they were there, but this is not something I've done any research on. <coughs> but there is an association that is there in Italy, in Rome. And I've often, whenever I've given talks about this in Europe, invariably there'll be one person who's a grandniece or a grandnephew of someone who was a prisoner of war in India. The numbers were huge. I think uh, Bangalore itself had 60,000, Bombay had more. But thank you for that question. Okay, uh, there is, I will come to YouTube in a bit. Let me just take this uh, question from the Q&A box. Uh, this is by Sarita Sundar, who is asking, uh, you know, thanks you for being able to relive uh, pages uh, from the Baba book, etc. And has a question to do with the idea of liberal or non-liberal nationalism. So if you look at this exhibition by the Nazi party on degenerate art, 
uh, it was uh, designed to inflame public opinion against modernism but did it not do the reverse in creating publicity towards art in the modernist uh, ideology and uh, she is curious about this in the context of creative freedoms and challenges that we face today uh, that's by sarita thank you sarita uh, i think i should uh, say for the benefit of those who don't know sarita is the designer who did design our baba book and you know we spent a lot of time pouring over archival material you are right that uh, the nazi exhibition did finally uh, create more sympathy for the modernist movement but i would say if you look at the year when it was held and when the modernists are able to come out again i mean in germany they are not able to they are i mean someone like hildi holger never gets to go back to vienna i mean she goes back to london she's really she had her full fledged school there or someone like magda nachman but of course towards modernism as such but those artists who were persecuted i think uh, you know they they never found their uh, place again in the same cities that they came from and i think if we look at the way in which uh, you know artistic and creative liberties are at stake now i feel that uh, i i always feel hopeful about art i don't feel that you know it'll all go away just because there is some repressive measures there are some repressive measures but thank you for the question okay so uh, let me hop over to uh, uh, youtube uh, by the way uh, dipya shankar if there are questions on facebook just put it in the chat so i can uh, take a look at it as well uh, so there is a question which came actually a very long time back but uh, we didn't interrupt you uh, abhinav choudhury is asking what was the significance of the great trigonometric survey of india uh on uh india's development before independence on the scientific development i guess uh of course this is a long way before uh the, you know independence yes. and baba uh but uh, yeah do you want to comment on the great indian trigonometrical survey yes in fact uh, you know when i uh, think of that i mean we had occasion to engage with that uh, you know the great arc and the great trigonometrical survey of india uh, when we were working on a book on the indian museum which is asia's oldest museum you know which uh, was created in 1814 and you see how you know uh, from the trigonometric survey which began in 1802 and was it, it mapped the land in a certain way it also helped the british strategize the way in which they would you know use the land and you know whether they'd use it for it was always for economic gain so whether they were going to mine whether they were going to uh, you know grow uh, plants because economic botany again flourishes in that period i think those were all linked and of course uh, there is a view that it gives us in independent india some uh, you know advantage because we inherit the railways we inherit certain communication systems we also inherit the kind of mapping that was done that that is right but it was not done with a view to helping you know india it was done with a view to getting profits from india and i think uh, you know it, it was done long before tifr i mean i'm looking at more recent history thank you if I, as a as since you pointed out the archives quiz uh, you know i have this little nugget of the in great indian trigonometrical survey which i mean might be an old quiz question but it's to me such a beautiful question that uh, so nain singh rawat who did a lot of the mapping i mean they had to you know the europeans weren't allowed in tibet and things like this so they used the local pandits uh, to do that and uh, you know the way they counted was they took these rosary beads which had normally 108 beads on a on a on a string but they had them with a 
so that they could count 100 steps and do their decimal uh, you know mathematics correctly uh, but mm -hmm. they were disguised as rosary beads but they had 100 but nobody really noticed that they had 100 and not 108 uh, <laughs> this is a small tidbit that i, I know from my quizzing uh, uh, things uh, anyway so from the trigonometric survey let's come to a question on youtube which is perhaps a bit uh, provocative uh, let me just find the window again. There we go. Uh, questions. Yes. So Ram uh, Shishadri is asking, it's probably not comfortable to ask, but did Homi Bhabha have too much power and say in how TIFR was set up and run? Uh, and he's giving the example of, I didn't ask you how much it cost. Uh, is that sort of, uh, you know, pointing to the fact that Bhabha had a rather arrogant style of, uh, of uh, running uh, TIFR? Uh, Sharad, I will come to your questions in a bit after this. Yes, uh, I think, you know, that is right. It was not, uh, you know, I think there are two things here. The, the money that was given to him initially to start was not, not a lot. But the arrogance that, uh, you know, you're talking about did not come from having money to start his institution. It was there. He came from a very... Uh, uh, he came from an elite uh, background. So I think some of it was there already. It is, uh, he's known to have been, you know, quite arrogant even to visiting European scientists. And there are stories that circulate about that. But at the same time, those who he encouraged uh, there were a range of people he encouraged. And that is why, you know, I, uh, having worked very closely with his papers, I came to admire certain things about him because, you know, some of the very humble workers who are in the workshop, like there was uh, one person, he must have uh, retired now, Savant, who talks about, you know, how on the day he joined, as Bhava was inspecting the workshop, going on his round, he looked at Savant and said, uh, remember to make your father proud, told him this in Hindi. And for Savant, that was like huge, you know, so this kind of, there are also these kinds of stories. Of course, there are stories of, you know, how uh, Professor Maitra told me that I got into the lift when Baba was there and I felt, oh my God, I shouldn't have got in. But I think your question whether, you know, this kind of too much power was good for the institution or not. Um, well, it certainly he ensured that the institution had the funds to do the kind of work that he brought his scientists to do. Uh, he, he did that. But towards the end, I think though he loved TIFR, and I think this is the more, excuse my putting a very provocative statement here, but I think TIFR is the more important institution compared to the other uh, atomic energy, which is there. But I think you know, the very uh, important innovative institution was TIFR. And yet he could not spend enough time there. He was so busy. So it was being run by Professor Menon for a very long time much before Menon became the director. So I think, you know, it's, uh, I, I don't think uh, he really ran the institution beyond the point. And uh, so I think, you know, obviously if he wanted to just hold on to power, he would not yield. He would say, as you see many people that I'll do this and I'll also do that. Uh, that I don't see in him. He seems to, you know, come to the institution on, Wednesdays, it's practically run by the dean, and uh, you have, uh, you know, you have the atomic energy occupying him fully. And of course, what Professor Menon had told me that before he left, he was saying, you know, I probably won't be able to continue because I'm being called to Delhi to become uh, the Minister of Science and. Uh, uh, this was uh, told in confidence at that time. I don't even know, uh, you know, it was just a, a discussion. It wasn't something that was in pen and paper. So, and Menon was already running it. So other scientists said that when Bhava died, it was a shock. 
but the institute ran because Maimon was uh, already running it in a certain way. Okay, uh, a few comments uh, and then, oh, okay, I see Venkat has just posted a few questions. Uh, let's quickly see how we can do it. We're heading, heading to 1225 already. Uh, let me just finish off with the YouTube ones. So Sharad on YouTube says, thanks for sharing an interesting part of history. And uh, he feels that as India at the start had the right kind of leaders to make India a powerhouse of scientific research on a global stage, but somehow, uh, you know, somewhere we've missed out reaching those heights and um, uh, would be happy to hear your views on it. So if you want a quick comment on that, and there are sort of, I would say, one more comment on uh, Zoom, and then there is a, a few sort of related questions which are more down the archives line that we should probably take. Okay, so I, I think I'll very quickly answer that question about leadership. I think uh, in, my, in my experience and also also looking at the archival material, Baba himself was feeling that uh, though he wanted to keep bureaucracy out, uh, even the IFR or the atomic energy establishment was becoming very bureaucratized. And today I, I see that, I see that continuously, you know, and I feel that is what has hounded our leadership, the inability to take very bold steps and say we will not have a bureaucratic ruling on everything. And I often share with uh, various uh, science, uh, you know, scientist friends, Baba's letters on, uh, you know, what should be the bureaucracy of a scientific institution. Uh, I mean, when I was in TIFR, I realized that uh, the staff was, I mean, uh, the scientists were fewer in number compared to the number of people you had running the establishment. So I think that that has been my been the case in other places as well. Okay, uh, uh, there is a comment from Nandini Oza on uh, uh, Zoom, which uh, she is very interested to know that the discouragement women faced even among the scientific minded community. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's just a comment. Uh, Venkat Srinivasan, uh, I guess you know him. Uh, has uh, two, what he says are vague -ish questions. Uh, is there any knowledge about how the public around TIFR viewed the building of this new research center and its place in society then and now? That's the first one. <laughs> well, Venkat, you know, the, the problem is, you know where TIFR is, right? Right at one corner. So there is very little, you know, the public around is basically those who are in, you know, in the Navy. And of course, uh, there are slums behind, which must have been there even then. And they, they were not there. Uh, no, I think they came up much later. Much later. So at that time, it was uh, like you really didn't see uh, the public interact with the building as such. You know, it, it was uh, really uh, in one corner of this Kolaba. So it, it, it's hard to answer that question. I haven't seen any evidence of it. Now, of course, the perception is, interestingly, the first time I came to TIFR, before I became the archivist, uh, I came from Bangalore and I was put, uh, you know, onto this flight and I was at NCBS where everyone told me, oh, you just turn up and, you know, you'll know where it is. Nobody knew where TIFR was. The taxi driver took me to Tata Memorial Hospital. And I said, no, this is a Tata Institute. And, and the crucial thing missing was Navy Nagar. So I had to emphasize that it is Navy Nagar. And then I was brought to the right place. Even so, after we went off in different directions inside Navy Nagar. So I think it is not, uh, during its time, I think people did uh, know a lot about it. Even in the time when Obed Siddiqui was there, he'd say, you know, the customs would, uh, when we were bringing in uh, animals for experiment, they would be very respectful and they'd say, you know, this is Tata Institute and someone would say, no, you have to say the full thing. 
its Institute of Fundamental Research. So, you know, Obed would laugh in that manner of his. But uh, I think that time, 60s, 70s, it was still known, better known uh, than when I came in 2003. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think even now taxi drivers probably do not know TIFR very well. Uh, but the second question is also, it's a long one, but it's an interesting question. I am struck by the humanism of the individuals who shaped these institutes in some of the stories you shared. There seemed to be a song, strong sense of relating to the world around them. When, or is it an if, did the institutions start to build small fences between research and contemporary issues of society? Maybe this is a question in, around encouraging a breadth of knowledge in additions to one's depth in a particular research area and allowing for debate and freedom around these. So do you have a comment on that? Well, my comment would be that, uh, you know, uh, I, I too agree. I don't know when exactly this happened, but I think you're right about the specialization. There are scientist friends I talk to while in TIFR and also friends in other institutions. They would say that, you know, prior to now in India, you have a number of institutions that are of comparable nature and size and specialization. But during the 70s and 80s, they'd say that, you know, we were often the only ones uh, working in this area. And my collaborator was in Princeton or was in Cambridge, and there was no one else who understood that kind of science. So I think uh, that is right. But I think now you have a different landscape where you have uh, many other institutions and TIFR is not the one ivory tower that it was. And you have a lot of, uh, you know, the more Chai and Y or these kinds of outreach programs you have would actually bring it closer, would let people understand what goes on. So, so on that note, thank you. That's what Chai and Y has been trying to do for the last so many years. Uh, bring the public uh, closer, give them a glimpse of the world, allow them to ask questions, allow them to interact. Uh, unfortunately, we are still online, but we would love to go back to our physical formats as soon as we can. So uh, we are now past 1230, and I think it's uh, probably time to uh, yet again say uh, another thank you to uh, Indira for this wonderful exploration of our past and telling us stories about the, the early days of TIFR and of science in India. Uh, so everyone wishing you all again a very happy Independence Day. And before we end, remember that August has five Sundays. So we will be back two weeks from now. And our fifth Sunday is always something about things you can, you know, it was always hands on things which we did. Uh, but uh, since this is uh, uh, online, uh, we will talk about how can you build a little lab at home and do experiments at home? OK, that sounds exciting, I think. And uh, we don't know when we will be allowed. I know things are opening up. People are asking us in September, will we be online or will we be uh, having physical sessions? The answer is we don't know. We have to be compliant with whatever the state of Maharashtra and the city of Mumbai, whatever the rules are, uh, as well as so theaters are not yet open. So as of now, it is online. If anything changes, we will definitely let you know. And even if we have a physical session, we will also do a simultaneous live stream. That is something which now we will do forever. So don't worry about that. So thank you all. Thanks, Indira, once again. Uh, thank you and have a great Sunday. Bye. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you.